and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two newcomers to the temple. They are the double-headed monster of Fabletop Productions. I I almost said I almost said table flop again. <laughs> oh. And the and the creators of the upcoming TTRPG, The Dread of Night, which we'll be getting into tonight. In the red corner, we have uh, jo we have Joe Frederick, and in the blue corner, we have Taylor James. Hi how there. Guys, <laughs> how you guys doing I'm tonight? Each other. <laughs> Uh, I'm doing company. Yeah, uh, one one duel. Uh, yeah, hey. you know, one one round. Just get it done with. But uh, <laughs> I'm doing good. Uh, as am I. Yeah. Yeah, happy to be here. So I gotta ask this out of, out of the gate: which one to use the abbot and which ways use the Costello? Uh, mm -hmm. I know what an abbot is. I don't know what <laughs> the other one is. Now, now, personally, I'm I'm quite informed, but I'll let you explain to my good pal. <laughs> I want to give you your chance to do the teaching part of the job, yeah. you know. <laughs> Abbott and Costello is a le is a legendary comedy duo, and one of their one of the routines that they're most known for is "Who's on First, which has its own spot in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm familiar with that old and, that joke. <laughs> and in the early days of YouTube, a couple of people um, did a World of Warcraft machinima called wow. "Who's the Tank." Huh. Oh. Ooh, machinimas are old. That's that's the kind of a callback. <laughs> but now obviously that's obviously that's not a serious question. That's just one of my usual icebreakers whenever I have two guys in 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 for the show. Just to see who just to see who which which one's the comedy act and which one's the straight man. Ah, I see. Well, uh, really, uh, I I think Costello is me just because that name sounds a little bit cooler than Abbott, so I'm gonna be taking Costello. <laughs> yeah, I didn't I didn't realize those were uh, names. They sounded like titles at first. Uh... <laughs> yeah, the Abbott that that's a bomb ass title. No, yeah, isn't that actually a title? Am I crazy? Uh, it, can be. it can be. Okay. All right. It is now. <laughs> That that's going straight in the tax information. Taylor James is the Abbot of Fabletop Production. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but as as an aside, I hope to God you don't put that on a business card or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, Shut but it down. Shut it down. <laughs> I I did just make a bunch of business cards, uh, and I'm excited to start passing them out. So. <laughs> uh, did were they improperly formatted for you two at first? No, no, mine uh, came out perfect. Oh, well, cool. Uh, cool. So, so did mine. <laughs> <laughs> Just Jack. has a watermark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I like to open this these kind of things with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. All right, TJ, I think it's, I think it's more fair if you start it off. All right, yeah. Um, so I was uh, in high school. Now I've always been kind of a, a creative. I've been writing novels and ideas for games and stuff like that since like as young as I can remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I, I did it for a long time, and I was really like more focused on video games, like and wanting to design those. But uh, in high school, around I think it was my sophomore year. Um, my dad got Dungeons and Dragons fourth edition uh, for Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like, yo, we, we got to play this, you know, get your brother, get your friends and, you know, let, let's try it out. And I was like, all right, you know, like that seems like a game. I've heard all about it from TV shows and shit, you know. And so uh, we got a gaggle of people together and uh, my dad jammed about like three sessions um, may maybe less, maybe just two, you know, but I remember I was so absolutely blown away by it. Like, I, I literally went to my room after those two sessions, and I spent six months basically making an entire redo, like, 
like homebrew guide based off of fourth edition using one of my old stories Mm -hmm. uh (laughs) and and like i it was like 300 pages and i i just never looked back i've been making my own systems and testing them i've literally played probably more of my own little homebrew systems and stuff than and anything else (laughs) in that regard i should i should count my blessings that you never um you never walked into my library because um if you if you were that ravenous with just fourth edition, you, <laughs> I know you, you go into you go into my library. You're not coming out. <laughs> it, oh yeah, and, and uh, we we have a friend that uh, that has a pretty nice library. Uh, more more of like board games, but they've got tabletops and all kinds of crazy stuff oh, yeah. too. Uh, and Mike, uh, director, if you're listening, uh, we're we're robbing you. <laughs> yeah, and. Uh, but yeah, and uh, so, you know, I, I just was completely invested. Like, it literally was, like, practically a calling, you know? Like, I just had been developing systems and learning about tabletops ever since then, you know? Uh, I've been doing it for about 10 years, but I know a few years down the line, you know, I was playing it with some of my friends, uh, you know, and Joe here is basically one of my friend's little brother and he he joined us one time and he loved it and i'll let him like take his side of the story from this point um yeah. um so yeah like tj said we're our families have actually been pretty close linked for a long time uh if you ask some of our older siblings there's the running joke that uh the guccionis and richardsons they're they're bound by blood you know we've always <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and yeah so TJ was really great friends with my older sister, Tippy, who I was really close with. So they would always kind of like hang out around the house and I would kind of work, you know, I'm like 12 years old at this point. I'm trying to fit in with all the cool kids because uh, because I'm a bit younger than TJ as of now. Uh, I think like maybe six or seven years younger. Yeah. Uh, I remember they were playing one of his uh, homebrew systems and uh i i was the the snotty like i want to play two guys and they're like it's not like something you can really like hop in on but you know tj was like really cool he had a few pre-made characters that like he had just like in his folder and uh they let me hop on and uh very similar experience as to tj i i played that one session for those few hours and i was i was immediately hooked and it's kind of funny how history repeats itself because that <laughs> next day I was like, "Oh, I got, I gotta make something." So I started writing this system. Uh, that one not nearly as close to fruition as TJ, but after that, I do remember I messaged him because we were friends on Steam, and I was like, "Hey, do you think like I I could maybe play one of those games with you?" And at the time, TJ was just so eager to DM. He was like, yeah, you want you want to do one? We could do two. We could do three. Just get anyone, bro. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we just kind of like started, you know, playing his systems from there. Uh, as I kind of like grew up, got through high school, I started making some of my own and I'd start running them. And uh, for me, it's been about ooh, maybe six years now that I've been invested in them, but uh yeah that's about as far as my upbringing with it goes Mm -hmm. so given given all given all of that would it be fair of me to say that the that the creation process of the dread of night just came from you guys um you guys home you guys homebrewing yourself into it (laughs) with uh in a way um Sorry, did you want to take this one, Joe, or uh, should no, I? Okay. Go ahead. Because, like, uh, you know, we, uh, like I said, I've been making a lot of systems, and I really liked, you know, uh, like, kind of building them from the ground up. I do draw a lot of inspiration from different guides and stuff that I started reading, especially later, because, like, my first few, I literally didn't even read guides. I played three sessions of D&D and just said, I can do it. Like, <laughs> I'll just make it up as I go. They weren't that good. The, to those... be fair, you're in good company. But, but like, uh, <laughs> but you know, like as I started reading more guides and you know, like extracting rules and different mechanics from different places, I, I did really like building things like almost basically from scratch. Uh, but we, at the time, we were playing Monster of the Week, you know, and we it was one of the first time our particular group played something uh, not homebrew, basically. 
Um, yeah. and, uh, and we loved Monster of the Week. Like, we, we ate that shit up. Um, and, uh, one of the few times we've ever finished a campaign of something, and then all of us collectively were like, let's do another one. Yeah. No, yeah, we, we, we usually hop from these little homebrews quite often. Uh, but, like, you know, uh, and, and so we loved Monster of the Week, and, and it was very nice to, like, you know, have something, at least for me, like, something I wasn't actively creating or, like, updating or changing <laughs> while I was playing. And, uh, and, you know, eventually, like, me and Joe were just kind of sitting there, and we were like, man, like, we we make systems, and we've been doing it. I've been doing it for 10 years, you know? And, uh, why don't we just, like, we do it for real? Um, and we thought that kind of sticking some to something we knew and something that we liked, you know, uh, we, we definitely want to, like, try to hit some of these more, like, from scratch systems, uh, that we have and whatnot, but, like, for our first, like, product, we really wanted something that had a good foundation, and we thought Powered by the Apocalypse, what was that, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, we enjoyed it so much, and it was already so solid and so easy to work with, you know, it was a lot of things that wasn't so complicated about it, you know, and kind of like to, I guess, like pay Amish, but also have a nice foundation for us to build off of. And uh, from from my end of that, I I found great interest in it, too, because, you know, I was it was the first like campaign I had really run outside of our usual group uh, monster of the week. So I was doing a lot of my own personal research into it. And uh, I do think it was you, TJ, who was like, yeah, they're like pretty open source about who can use the apocalypse system mm. like yeah there's any heavy copyright laws like you can literally you can go to the apocalypse world website and there's like an article from vincent baker who's like yeah you can use my system just like shoot me an email if you want to use the logo and that's pretty much it uh, i've actually exchanged a few emails with him he's he's really great um but yeah so i just have a lot of the creators of these systems, Michael Sands included, um, that, and I was getting a little bit into Blades in the Dark at the time. It's just, it seems like a really good, like, pick up to start system for any player, as well as, like, the community around it is so great. There's a lot of great people I've met, like, in the past few weeks of kind of, like, going around and talking about the book, who are just some of the most creative people in the community that I've really met. Uh, so the the powered by the apocalypse system just it seemed like a good fit for our goals at the time, a good entryway point for us and our community. And what I ha what I have noticed is that even though it's even though it's a powered by the apocalypse game, um, I appreciate that it is that it's it's not a case where you can where you can go you can go in from playing from from playing well apocalypse world and ju and jump straight into this without having some pro without having some problems. We we definitely push a little bit of the the term powered by the apocalypse. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which, we got a little crazy with it. <laughs> which to to be f once again you get once again you're in good company, and <laughs> to to illustrate that, let me get let me give you a bit of a, let me give you a bit of a history lesson. Um, I've met, before we went live we were, we had to we had talked about um. RPGs based in based in Middle Earth. The earliest one in, one is Middle Earth role playing. That is a streamlined adaptation of the rule set for Rollmaster, which was at the time created by Iron Iron Crown. We now have a, a modern successor called Against the Dark Master. Rollmaster started out as Arms Law, which was a collection of house rules for AD and D, and as Arms Law developed further and further, it became its own system known as Rollmaster. Okay. And that, that's why that's why I say that's why I say you're you're in good company because that's one example of that kind of thing. It, you dig around enough, you're going to see a lot of this of that story of. So of somebody wanting to do an extensive house rule of an existing system and yeah. it just takes on a life of its own afterwards. 
yeah uh, it, it's crazy you know i i've been trying to like well uh like educate myself in the tabletop world because i i pretty much jumped in pretty pretty blind you know <laughs> at first uh you know years ago but i, I hadn't really heard of like most of those you just <laughs> you just dropped and now i'm like oh man i guess yeah. i haven't been digging hard enough Heritage. i know i'm sweating over here uh <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I guess some habits die hard. Uh. <laughs> yeah, and I've, I will, I will admit, I, I will admit, I have a bit of bias due to the sheer amount of research that I've that I've done. But the but the point is 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 that th is that there's always there's always patterns when you di when you dig around enough. Um, and. Now, when it comes when it comes to when it comes to the dread the dread of night itself, were you guys are, were you guys already um are it's were you guys already fans of of that of that kind of dark fantasy approach? Is is that part of the reason why you went with that one? Uh yeah um, yeah there th this is something more TJ can answer, but I do remember there was there was a crazy book that you had read before that like because i basically called him we were shooting messages back and forth about hey do we want to like actually give a collaborative effort here on something and we basically were shooting messages back and forth and we called and we were spitballing like okay we want to do powered by the apocalypse what kind of system do we want to do <laughs> and uh I, I don't know how much i've really said this outside of our circle but i was very much pushing for <laughs> believe it or not a, a full-blown pirate system at the time uh, I yeah. to the seven seas get the swashbuckler the captain and uh there's there's more jokes about that uh for another time but i do remember tj said that he had read a book that was very dark fantasy that you wanted to take a king to if you want to like go over that tj um i don't what remember that name? book though <laughs> <laughs> uh that but what what I do know is like when we were talking about it, you know, uh, and, and the possible pirate theme or other themes that we can do, you know, for me to to draw a lot of inspiration. Kingdom Death um, Monster, by the way. <laughs> oh shit, that's right. Yeah. I, I have <laughs> that, my notes pulled up. <laughs> that is crazy. That was crazy. Uh, I wish I could actually get a copy of the like the real book. Uh, <laughs> I got a mortgage, and I'm sure you could. <laughs> oh yeah, but um. You know, for me, since yeah, I run like a tabletop simulator, <laughs> <laughs> oh hell yeah! But um, you know, uh, like for me, it's always kind of like narrative first in a way. You know, I always have a story, and then I build my systems and mechanics or a game around that. And and so you know, like to me, like lore is very important, and you know, and we still want to give the versatility and the openness that tabletops always have. But, you know, I know, like, Blades in the Dark has something where they give you, like, a lot of lore to just work with, like, for fun, you know? Like, and I really like that. And uh, and so I had a story, you know, in particular, and I, and I basically told Joe this, like, when we were first starting out. Like, hey, I've got this story. It's pretty vague. Like, a lot of my stories have, like, a lot of, like, lore, and it's already really fleshed out, and I can get, like, really stubborn and nitpicky about it. But this one, like, it's not that fleshed out. I still really like it, you know, and so that way we can both work on it and like make decisions about how it can go, you know, without me getting that like kind of, I guess, like writer's anxiety. Um, and, and you know, and, and it was a good, it was a dark story, you know, uh, basically about like the spectral guardian class. That's why it's like one of the few originals, you know, and, yeah. and the spectral guardian class came from that story. And so, you know, we used that as our, like, narrative baseline. And since it wasn't super fleshed out and I didn't, like, do too much on it, it gave Joe a lot of freedom to inject his own creativity and add on it, you know. Um, and and so, you know, since I was able to use that as kind of, like, the inspirational anchor, you know, that's why we ended up going with the dark fantasy theme, you know. And, and I do know, like, hearkening back to Kingdom Death, is that I remember someone gave me a pitch for that game and it sounded really, really, really cool. Like <laughs> they were like, 
this idea of you know that you work throughout like a season to hunt monsters and it you know and you have to do these crazy rituals and stuff um and just this idea of like being like hunters in a more primitive or or like older like tribe or or people or town or village and like looking out into the dark at what monsters might lurk there you know and in my mind this was very like kind of like a, a more i guess uh grounded setting you know um a more like realistic other than the monster setting and kingdom death is definitely not like that <laughs> Uh, but I did, I still liked that feeling, that, like, kind of imagination spark mm -hmm. um, that went off in my brain. And so, you know, that was kind of, like, the thematic tone that we were really trying to draw up, was this idea of, like, you know, like, it was once normal, you know, but now it's not. And that, that sense of, like, you know, uh, the hunters and the seasons, and just kind of taking that, like, pitch that someone gave me for Kingdom Death, and, like kind of running with that you know and i think that's really what drove uh a lot of the game's direction and and, and was its spark mm -hmm. no yeah. it wouldn't it wouldn't be a powered by the apocalypse project if i didn't de if i didn't delve into the playbooks yeah <laughs> you guys you guys certainly have a certainly have a few of them <laughs> yeah. uh, mo more than 10 <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so I'd like I'd like to I'd like to go down I'd like to go down the list and ju and just just go into what some of the thought processes were when it came to creating it and the play and the play style that each one is meant to kind of encourage of course uh, so I'll start I'll start with the accursed ember <laughs> All right, yeah. Could you guess the inspiration? I mean, <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll mainly let TJ because I, I think we'll split these up into like because we both took turns writing classes. Now, granted, over the course of development, there were a lot of changes that like we both would make over one of the each classes. But as far as the inspiration goes. Um, I do want to just point out, like, at the front, we basically had the Spectral Guardian. Mm -hmm. And something I thought that was really cool about Monster of the Week is uh, the the tropes that they kind of, like, lean into with their... Because it's, like, very much based on, like, kind of, like, early, like, supernatural Buffy the Vampire Slayer-esque TV shows. So you'd have, like, oh, the professional who, like, the the experienced guy who works with the group. And then you'd also have, oh, you're the mundane. You're you're the comic relief character. Mm -hmm. um, so pretty quickly early on, I thought like, hey, if we're doing this dark fantasy setting, I think it would be kind of cool if we like leaned into some of these other like dark fantasy, but also like monster slaying like titles. Um, and I remember like, <laughs> I'll, I'll bring this up now, but. TJ was basically writing the Spectral Guardian, and I started writing a class that's actually gotten moved over to the expansion if we hit that goal, uh, the Wild Blade, which is uh, inspired by the Legend of Zelda. But I uh, hope I can say that. Uh, you know, <laughs> take it easy. Um, but Nintendo I remember... hasn't gotten on me for promoting, from, for promoting <laughs> Reclaim the Wild. You're fine. Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> um but I remember I was like, I'm going to like make a like a Zelda inspired class. And then teachers like, oh, well, at that point, I got to make a Witcher class. Yeah, so <laughs> I like I finished up, you know, the Wild Blade and it was like 2 a.m. at that point. And I was like, hey, man, I've been I've been driving all day. Uh, this is basically kind of some of my ideas. I'm going to go crash. And TJ was like, oh, yeah, you know, what? I'll, I'm going to wrap this class up and I'm going to hit the hay, too. And uh, so I went to bed that night and I woke up and I'm looking and I have like 18 messages in my DMs and I'm like, OK, so I look and TJ frantically <laughs> throughout the, the entire night was like, OK, so I had a bunch of ideas and I, I come back to the Google Doc, which originally only had like four pages on it. <laughs> and now it suddenly had like 48 and there were like six new classes. And I was like, God damn. So. 
a lot of these in the base game were TJ written, but I, I I've got my winners in there, and I'll make sure to call them out when they come. Mm. But yeah, uh, but to to uh, digress a bit on onto your question, so the the accursed ember obviously is very Dark Souls inspired. In terms of like functionality and play style, I really wanted them because like in Dark Souls, you know they they're very big about like kind of the versatility of your play style and your class. Like you can be a strength dex character or a strength int or you know a pure int or this or that. You know, and even allowing you to switch that play style, I wanted to kind of replicate that as best as I could into that class you know and so they have like their basic moves i would say there's a lot of like core features that are just useful for any accursed ember you know things uh hearkening to their combat roles uh you know a special potion that only heals them um you know li just nice little things that anyone would be nice to have but when it gets into their more advanced features and and, and building the actual class they they start to specialize into like a variety of fields and this i think really defines the accursed ember because those specializations like kind of touch a lot of the different play styles their classification in the game is known as an all-rounder mm -hmm. which means they can kind of you know it can either mean they can do everything or they can potentially do everything you know so either like a jack of all trades or they're specialized, but has the potential to go in a lot of different directions. And it's definitely the latter here. Where, like, they'll definitely, like, have a style. They'll be a tank, or be a mage, or be, you know, an archer or something. But, like, they, they can be any of these things, you know, depending on how they build their character. Um, yeah, they're and so, cool. yeah, they are. <laughs> And just as a as a funny little anecdote about the Accursed Ember, like, obviously, a lot of classes go through a lot of changes, you know, and a lot of updates, and, you know, we, we've, you know, some classes outright got removed, and some got put in, and, but the Accursed Ember was probably one of the least changed classes <laughs> in the whole list. Like, I made that in that fever that night, and it's just kind of stayed there. I think we added a couple moves late in the game, but... You know, like it, it's just kind of stuck around. Uh, been pretty, a pretty solid uh, <laughs> uh, class through it all. Yeah. Now, with the, moving on, moving on from that, next would be the commoner. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! <laughs> all right, this one's all me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, I'll, I'll throw out my personal bias up here. Um, uh, hearkening back to my personal major inspiration, uh, Monster of the Week, we had mentioned before that we had done, you know, a, a full campaign, and then we started to do a second one. It's how we fell in love with the Powered by the Apocalypse system. Um, for any of those of you who have played it, um, I... I was repping the mundane. I saw that you were the you were the weak guy with no powers. And I was like, dude, that sounds so funny. So I, I picked the mundane and it it became a joke within our friends that like J Joe was the mundane like rapper. Um so that's a little bit of my personal attachment to it, but there was a point where we were developing the classes. Now, the commoner canonically was the last class that we ever made for the main book. Um, we had our 12 classes and we had like equally like distributed between the different classifications of like hybrid, all arounder, warrior, mage, rogue. Um, but as I started to do a few more test runs of the game myself, as I was watching TJ run it, um, it became pretty abundant that I think we needed like the everyman to kind of fill out the roster um, because something that maybe this is a personal thing between TJ and I, but we're very like character driven, you know, narrative focused. We like to have our characters, you know, pop up in our stories and, you know, our, our players can kind of accrue a catalog of NPCs if they desire them. And there was swiftly becoming a problem that there was like no real, like if there was a character that wasn't really like supposed to be like a main hitter there wasn't really anywhere that we could place them 
Um, and I thought, you know, as we were starting to write up some of our pre-made, you know, stories, we wanted to have these like characters that were either like, oh, you run into a fellow spell sword or a cursed ember. But we wanted to make this kind of like piece for DMs that they could be like, oh, here's random townsfolk Jimmy. He's a commoner and here's like eight, like at the time, really weak abilities. So if you just wanted a player that like wanted to be the everyman, like no powers, just was like along for the ride to support the fellow like players in the journey. Uh, we wanted the commoner to kind of fill that spot. And it's got a lot of potential for players to like kind of respec and be like, oh, I started as a commoner, but along the journey, I became a folk hero or I became a wanderer. Um, as far as their like functionality, like in the game itself, they quickly became a support class. They're the only uh, class in the whole game that has the category support. Um, they're not really good at combat. Um, they can't cast spells at all. All of their uses are pretty niche, but when they come into play, they are, we actually found their they're very, very strong <laughs> than we initially intended, which not like broken by any means. It's just, they're very niche situations. But if you have a commoner, that's like, I can help with this. Then they're like really good in that particular field. Um, so I guess in the like long story short, they were kind of meant to kind of help fill out the world and give GMs more of a tool, but also players can have a lot of fun with them if they decide to go on the path of less valor and, you know, victory and more of a supporting role. Yeah. So the next one on the list would be the condemned. All right. So, uh, you know, that one, uh, is, is, uh, one of my personal favorites it was uh inspired by berserk which i just fucking love that anime movie story just the whole thing uh, i hope to but, god, when you say you love the whole thing i hope to god you're not you're not counting the 2016 anime oh i i haven't seen it so i no, I, I wouldn't know Pro tip, don't. <laughs> it's bad yeah i keep hearing it it makes me really sad like cuz i'm like... just kind of like it's berserk even the worst of Berserk can't be that bad, yeah. right? Like, have, like volume one of Ruby animators, but like sweep deprive and with one <laughs> heart tied behind their back. <laughs> Oof. It's well, not... uh, well, and, oh, oh. And being directed by somebody who up until that point had only done slice of life anime. Oh shit! Oh god, I didn't even know that part. <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, there was that. It was clear he was completely out of his depth. The term well, I often, the term that gets used a lot around here is punching above weight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, w with all that in mind, uh, the condemned, you know, was pretty straightforward. He's a pure warrior class, you know, and it, it's, it, you know, I literally was just like, if somebody wants to role play a guts, they they can do it. You know, we just. Uh, uh, my main thing that I tried to instill in that particular class was the idea of kind of like this high risk, high reward, this, you know, the type of thing where like, you know, the closer they are to death, then like the stronger they get, you know, so it almost like encourages the player to like kind of take that gamble and, you know, like take the heat, you know, there there's a lot of like spells and different moves that help the hunters protect each other, you know, and so, but the condemned might be tempted to uh, either do more of that, you know, fulfilling their role as, like, the fighter, you know, but also maybe not getting protected by their friends and maybe doing something reckless on their own because they, they kind of want the damage, you know, or mm -hmm. received and given. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it's it's just uh, very straightforward, but I, every condemned that's been uh, around has been very strong you know and uh i always have a good time playing with them because they they're strong but they're also like in a way like kind of predictable you know uh mm -hmm. and uh but i think they 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 always fulfill the niche that i like of like a high damage warrior you know warriors are kind of my uh safe zone my go-to in most rpgs so i did have a lot of fun making it and it's a uh, uh, just uh as straightforward as that 
if you like tanking and you like doing damage, the Condemned is uh, j just for you. <laughs> and, uh, I think you told me that you were writing them more inspired by the Golden Age, right? Not not too much after that. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. yeah. Not nothing. You know, uh, in the deep manga stuff. Although that's that stuff is awesome. But like, you know, it was very much kind of just what the anime or the movies would would cover. You know. Because I still, in a sense, even though there's a lot of fantastical stuff in this world and this story, the idea in my mind is that a lot of the the people, to an extent, are still within the realm of, like, a grounded uh, existence. You know, yeah. there are definitely some classes that aren't, but, you know, we'll, we'll get to those, so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, but the next one that I had on the list was the Enchanting Witch. All right, Tej. All right. Well, uh, the Enchanting Witch, uh, you know, it it was kind of inspired by The Witcher. We did leave like a little note with like an asterisk there, you know. <laughs> but it, it really is just my attempt at uh, making kind of like what I've understood and learned about like folktale witches. You know, mm -hmm. there is definitely some direction I would say from. Uh, that I took from, like, the Witcher series, but, you know, in reality, like, I've, I studied anthropology in college and whatnot, and specifically, you know, studied a lot of, like, uh, magic and, and religion and witchcraft and stuff, uh, you know, via that anthropology, and I've always been fascinated by it. So I tried to integrate just some of those things, and Joe even actually helped out in, like, making some of the uh, rituals they have on one of their pages, you know, and, and they're just very inspired by like a lot of like folk tales or, you know, um, older, uh, rhetorics or renditions of like the, like the, the enchanting witch, the beautiful, you know, spell casting woman type of thing. Of course, you know, it's doesn't have to be a woman, but like, you know, that's definitely kind of the, the baseline, uh, no. And in terms of play style, uh, the enchanting witch, is a very, I would say, like, it, it's a supportive spellcaster, but more in the way of, like, disarming the enemies rather than buffing your allies, mm -hmm. you know? So they're, they're a pure mage class, but they have a lot of moves that are very, like, good at, like, kind of uh, controlling and messing with the enemies in the field about, you know? They get zone a lot of bonus... Oh, sorry. No, zone control, that's just... Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so they they have a lot of, like, you know, that, like, I'll help you by hurting them type of thing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, oh, sorry. No, that that was it. Uh, I actually do have a question for you, Mildra, about something on the Enchanting Witch. More, more I want to gauge your opinion. Um, so we, we have an ability on here, just, just kind of for fun. It's called Inked Companion. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is, like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm really going there, TJ. I gotta know his opinion. Uh, so it's basically this like tattoo that the enchanting witch can have that can like, and using an action, you can summon an animal. It's like meant to be kind of a familiar that you like the witches have conjured into their skin that they can summon at whim. Um, now we have that move named Inked Companion. Uh, now what what would your opinion be? if it were to be named familiar art, like familiar art at the end. Uh, I, if, if you're, if you're dealing with animal companions, um, calling it familiar art, I would actually be against that. Damn it. <laughs> no, I, no, I enjoy the, I, I enjoy the pun. <laughs> I enjoy the pun. That's not, that's not the problem here. <laughs> the problem is there's a connotation when it comes to, um, familiars. Like a lot of people, they're going to view familiars as as very as very small as small animals that can do can do certain utility things, but their usefulness is go is going to be is going to be a bit limited. Um, no, yeah, that's that's what I told TJ too. And so. <laughs> and 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 the concept of an animal companion well the best way for me to put it is is what's con is what is considered 
eligible for an animal companion versus a familiar. Familiars right. are things like a mouse, maybe maybe a maybe a dog, maybe a maybe a snake or a sp or a spider. Um, yeah. The kind of the kind of things that would be akin to a domesticated pet. Whereas an animal companion can be those things, but it could be it could be something like a hunting dog. It could be something like a boar or a or a full, or a full on bear if somebody wants to be that brave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, or 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 fuck it, let's just throw an owl bear into the mix. <laughs> Hell or, yeah. Or some some sea some seafaring type may want may want it to be a um a a, a um octopus or something like that. Yeah. Uh, of course there's plenty of other animals in 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 other in other environments that could, that could be that could be that could be utilized. Um, no, that just uh, that was a, an inside <laughs> joke around around the team is that like when we wrote that ability, I was like, dude, familiar. It's so funny. <laughs> and everyone was like, no, that's n <laughs> literally terrible. <laughs> I like the here's the here's the thing. I like the pun. It's ju it's just that for a, for a naming convention, it's going to create. It's going. It's going to. It's going to put certain images in people's heads that may not fit. Yeah, it might work for a different type of system and setting or ability, but for what we have it as for right now, it's. I I'll admit defeat publicly, but it, it's coming back. Keep an eye out on future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's all right. My name got canned too. Uh, one one of the other team members actually named that one. They were like, both your names are bad. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what did you have it as? Like blood? I I literally don't even remember. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. we can move on. Sorry mm -hmm. about that. Now, when it comes to the when it comes to the Exorcist, um, because of the since it's clearly inspired by the by the Bel by the Belmonts. Um, yeah. Yep. I do, I do have to ask the question if you guys end up getting exposed to the Belmonts through. The Castlevania anime, or had you, had you already cut your teeth on some of the games? Uh, um, I had cut my teeth on some of the games. Uh, from I the game. was mostly from the anime. I did play a little bit of Symphony of the Night, barely got anywhere, and I did play the original, like the original original, uh, and I was very bad at it. But uh, With all the goddamn mo Medusa heads. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like... Uh, I mostly fo was from the anime myself. Oh. Um, I I played through Harmony of Dissonance, and uh, I started to play through Circle of the Moon. And I remember on one of the virtual consoles, I did try to play through the original, but <laughs> again, could could not get too far. But to be fair, Nintendo hard is a thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank and... God for save states. <laughs> and um. It's not. It's not even the. It's not even the worst case of it because I've had. I've had my fair share of horror stories regard regarding um regarding say Kaizo Mario or, or oh god you're a braver man than I <laughs> um, yeah Kaizo Mario is the reason why I have a punching bag next to my desk <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because there were plenty of times where. In going through that, I f I felt I had I felt I had to punch something. Oh, it's, oh it's yeah! Incredible. I couldn't get past the first level, low key. And like, <laughs> couldn't be me. If I ha if I have to use actual Nintendo games for this kind of Nintendo hard um battle toads, I've suffered oh, through battle toads. The get the game that it the game that is one giant trap, because it, it lures you in thinking you're going to be in for a fun beat 'em up. And then you get to the motorcycle scene, and it it all goes to shit so fast. <laughs> mm -hmm. It oh. does make me wonder who was shitting in someone's coffee <laughs> at, at, at rare that at rare that week. Uh, then again, then again, um, I'm reminded of how Tomb of Horrors was created because somebody somebody had the gall to say to Gygax, "Hey, these modules are getting kind of easy." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've heard about the Tomb of Horrors. <laughs> um, it's also how we got the Black Page because Zappa's band was saying that the um, that the instrumentation was getting a, was getting a bit routine. 
And he's like, mm -hmm. "Oh, all right. I will make the most co I will make the most complicated piece possible." And that's how he that's how we get the black page or how or how to make your um drum how to make your drummer friend hate you. <laughs> Because but, uh, all I have to do is just show sheet music, and he's and he's like, "Oh, f fuck off, man!" <laughs> but I would, but I would guess that with the with the way with the way the Exorcist is set up, you probably have a lot of nods to some of the sub weapons that were oh, famous yeah. throughout the games. Uh, I I know that I'll I'll give a little bit of credit to one of the members of the team, uh, uh Jade Kathy. Uh, one of my best friends when we were first writing the first week I like shot them a message and I'm like yeah we're actually going to do this legit and we're making like a system with like all these nods to like dark fantasy titles and I was actually telling them about the spell sword but we'll get there when we get there um, but they were like oh yeah and you have a Castlevania class right I was like of course I do <laughs> they totally have that <laughs> Um, so I, I will give them, they, they gave me the inspiration. So brownie point to you, mm -hmm. but yeah, some of the first things I did write down was, uh, Holy Concoction and Hell's Frozen Over. Definitely yeah. wanted to incentivize the, like the, the ranged weapon artillery rule that they had. And I, I did workshop. I, I remember spending an hour on it. I wanted to try to find a way that like, maybe their starting move allowed them to like have like either fire or ice equipped and that would alter how different weapons or tools used but it just became like way too complicated and i was like this is a this is not supposed to be a very in-depth like this is too you were too you were thinking of integrating the orb system <laughs> from from dissonance uh i haven't heard of it but it that sounds pretty correct um uh, harmony both harmony of dissonance and lament of innocence had this whole thing of sub weapon and element combinations oh oh like the the castlevania yeah harmony of dissonance. okay yes sorry i thought you were talking about a tabletop yes no uh the harmony of dissonance was what i was playing around the time writing the exorcist and i thought that was the coolest shit uh, uh, i usually t i usually tell people with whenever they say they want to make a castlevania class um ignore Ignore all of the ignore all of the Symphony of the Night style appro style approaches on <laughs> Go back and go back and play Super Castlevania Four and Rondo of Blood. Okay. And you and just go if you if you're trying to because obvi obviously obviously using Symphony of the Night wouldn't fit yet. <laughs> Save save that save that for later, but yeah, oh, we got that uh, under our caps already. Don't worry. <laughs> but the stuff like the G, stuff like the GBA trilogy um, is to, it would would be far too all over the place. With yeah. the with the two D Castlevanias, you have a foundation to build around. And even the even the first Lords of Shadow would would count for this. Um, I say the first one because. That's because that's the one that people shat on for not being like Symphony of the Night, even though Mercury Steam had no interest in trying to do that. Yeah, their their inspiration was Super Castlevania Four. Mm. Um, if you're a masochist, maybe you can dig up Simon's Quest, but um, <laughs> again, if you're a masochist, and it's not that it's not that it's hard. It just has okay. what my what my brother calls guy damn it. Yeah. <laughs> oh well as far as the exorcist goes there's definitely a lot there that i did pull from the various games that at least i had personally played mm -hmm. um but as far as their functionality in the game goes uh they serve as a very tanky mage not really like a on mage but secondary they're considered a hybrid between mage and warrior um a they have a... huh a gish yeah um, they have a lot of versatility in their weapons. Um, they have one of the strongest moves in the game where they can actually use ranged weapons as quick attacks, basically doubling your attack output. But they also do have a lot of like magical applications. They can add fire or ice to their spells for free if they have the right moves. Um, they, they are pretty cool. <laughs> I, I, I know that's very plain and simple, but I was just... I, they went through a lot of changes throughout the development, 
Yeah. I don't actually think they were meant to be a mage at first, but we did look back at them uh, in post, and we were like, okay, there's enough here that they could fit the bill. Um, although I will give you a little behind-the-scenes tip about the Exorcist as far as their art goes. Uh, that's our least favorite picture <laughs> in the whole book. Uh, it's it's the only one that like I think that we really do want to get a redesign done before, like, the official print but yeah mm -hmm. so um, next, next up uh, was is the that i wanted to ask is the folk hero all right yeah and, and th this one it kind of has a similar uh i guess like story as the enchanting witch it was another one of those that i made in that long night <laughs> stint um it also went through a lot of changes, but the folk hero is, uh, you know, tr true, true and tried like tank fighter um, in terms of functionality. But, uh, you know, we we wanted to do something more interesting. You know, they were a little bit boring at first um, and there wasn't much like calling to them. And, and uh, admittedly, a lot of the like, I think, positive changes that came did did come from Joe. Um and uh you know but like it eventually became more about this uh because we started not just classifying them by class but also by like attributes they should favor type of thing you know like mm -hmm. um the exorcist it, sh it focuses on agility and arcane you know uh being you know using agility for their ranged attacks and you know the arcane for their magic type of thing and the folk hero, we decided to focus on their influence, which is like their charisma stat. And and so now they have a lot of moves that are like really about like commanding the aura or like the people around you, especially like commoners. You know, they can call upon commoners. They have like uh, kind of like better outcomes on certain conversations, you know, so they're not they're not just a great tank, you know, and can take a lot of damage and protect a lot of people, but they can also be a great, like, face of the party, you know? Uh, in their starting move, like, villagers are more, like, might know them, you know? They kind of, like, are encouraged to, like, craft up a tale, whether it's real or not, you know? We, we had a resident folk hero that their whole thing is that they, they took down a bull, but people keep exaggerating it more and more uh, in, into like some kind of monster and <laughs> so it's the fish like, story yeah <laughs> and uh but you know like um and, and so they they kind of have like this 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 kind of charismatic element to them as well as to being the tank you know um and so do serve as like the most on support tank or at least one of because they have a lot of abilities that they give their allies plus one forwards if certain requirements are met. Um, I know they, they can give more. a lot. <laughs> yeah, it through playtesting, it's not to the point where it's like ludicrously broken, but it it's really damn good because they have a few abilities where it's like if someone sees them roll a critical success, or if the party rolls a critical success, everyone gets a plus one forward. So even if you're like a folk hero who's like trapped or stuck or not really doing too much by simply existing in the fight you are supporting your team yeah and they, they honestly a folk hero can make uh, a really uh, can make a team for yeah. real mm -hmm. so next on the list is the magus and <laughs> since since you meant since Lord of the Rings is is mentioned as inspiration, I'm guessing that this it, that this this falls into the category of a lot what a lot of people consider the scholarly wizard. Yes, indeed. Uh, <laughs> the Magus went through many changes, uh, <laughs> to, to put it lightly. Um, you know because uh, you know I, I'm just I'm just gonna have to out him. You know. Oh. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure out of the three of us here, uh, only two of us have seen Lord of the Rings. Oh, um, <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. Put it on and, the list. And, you know, and I'm I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan. You know, I, I read the books and I watched the movies and whatnot. And it, it was like a bit of a, of a departure because, you know, I wouldn't really call it dark fantasy. But I was like, man, like, 
it's a classic. You know, if we're doing inspirations, it's got to be there, you know? Um, and uh, so I added it. And, uh, you know, and straight up, in a lot of ways, it really was just uh, the Gandalf class. Um, I, I took a lot of inspirations from some of the cooler visual elements they emulated in the movies and stuff. And uh, yeah. it's in specific. And, um, you know, but they they slowly kind of expanded out from that because they, they were a little bit tame, to be honest, because we, we had a lot of classes, you know, folk heroes giving, you know, plus ones for doing backflips and, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> accursed embers combat rolling and backstabbing people and mm -hmm. all this cool, awesome shit. And, you know, the like, uh, unfortunately, like it was just it was very tame, you know, but through a lot of debate and back and forth uh with, with uh joe and i you know we we finally got it to a place where like we we did try to hone in more on the scholarly wizard now they they have cool abilities that are like you know still hearkening back to some of the stuff lord of the rings was doing but we we also have a lot of cool things like they can learn spells and like share secrets with other magi they have like kind of like intrinsically are a part of like a, a school of like kind of like science i guess you know um they have their graduation which is like their their like superior form of mage where you can you know get a title like warlock or wizard or sorcerer and uh you know and so now they they definitely have a more that wide berth and investment in the like kind of like the scholarly pursuit type of thing um i i've always liked the idea of like magic as a science you know uh, as a concept, you know, where people treat it like it's a science too, you know, and 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 not just like some mystical force outside, I I impossible to understand. There's still some of that. I would say the witch is more closer to that, but like, you know, the magus is like the one that does, you know, the the testing and and has the bottles and you know documents and whatnot. And with that in mind, you know, they are the other pure mage class. Um, you know, in that regard, uh, they're they're pretty straightforward. You know, uh, I would say they're they're pretty, I guess, classic. You know, they can they can do a lot of stuff in terms of their magic, and their magic is actually pretty versatile. Um, we do have like a pretty, I guess, in depth uh, magic system. I know when we played Monster of the Week, uh, I was kind of like. I don't like how this magic works. It's it's too vague. It and I, a little <laughs> underwhelming. They just gave and, you like 10 outcomes with no real rules. And so I, I made like a whole magic system, which is basically the one we have in this game about the four categories of divination and hexing, um, illusions and warding, um, which, you know, I kind of inspired off of like real world magic that I've studied and whatnot. And, uh, or we, you know, read about, I should more say. <laughs> it makes it sound like I was there. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but, uh, and so uh, the Magus really can explore a lot of those options um, in terms of his play style or their play style. Um, and uh, and they, they can just utilize a lot of those different elements. And in that, in that sense, they truly are like the core pure magic class, you know. Um, I guess, like, kind of the all-rounder, but specifically for spellcasting. Yeah, and uh, I definitely, it, it was one of the longest-running jokes, is that I definitely dogged on the Magus. <laughs> um, I uh, did not want it to change, like, so bad. Yeah. And he's just like, it's not good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and, like, they definitely did get there now, but there was a point, and take this with a grain of salt, I don't remember what the original abilities were offhand, but I do remember I was like, dude, TJ, we have witches who can literally like enchant a whole field of people to not attack you. And this guy, if you give him 10 minutes, can unlock a door. And, <laughs> and uh I, I did give him a lot of a lot of sass for it, but I do think they are in a really good place. And I did end up coming around on a lot of the abilities, just with like some minor tweaks made just to make them a bit more versatile. Um yeah. something you'll see coming around the bend here, uh is we definitely did upscale the power of a lot of these classes and uh the magus was just one of those that it did kind of get outscaled at a certain point but mm -hmm. in turn for you exposing me i will point out just a 
funny little anecdote that <laughs> while I've been writing some of the scripts for uh, these these class trailers that are going up on all of our socials, um, we have on the class uh, class class designated pages uh, these little play this class if you dot 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 and like <laughs> four little little headers. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, keep in mind the history of the past eight months of me butting heads with TJ about, like, how great the Magus is. I go and I'm like, all right, what did what did he write about the Magus? Because I hadn't looked at this section in a minute. And the first thing I read is, play this class if you like being the smartest player at the <laughs> <laughs> And, like, I know the intent is, like, oh, they're the scientists. But it was so written, like, if you want to be, like, intelligent and make the smart voice. Yeah, like, not talking about the character. (laughs) Just you as a person. But, uh, no. The Magus, they're pretty cool. Uh, I I highly recommend Enchanted Cloak. It's the best movie. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. Now... Next, next up, the Monster Slayer, which obviously, obviously, with that armor, I can see, I can see the Geralt compare the Geralt um, inspirations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, it's very inspired by The Witcher, you know. And, uh, and I was playing a lot of uh, The Witcher Three, uh, like early, early in in development, and I was super enamored. Um, and uh, I end up watching the show, and I enjoyed the show. I don't think it's good, but I enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> a lot of ju- people are just, mad about it right now. <laughs> just because I really like that world. And, and to be honest, I would even say that the world of the ri- the Witcher gave a lot of uh, inspiration for me personally throughout the process of making this world. You know, they they did a lot of really. Th- a lot of things well, especially in terms of their rituals and some of the creepy magic and the monsters. And, uh, but with the Monster Slayer in specific, you know, uh, we obviously wanted to keep some of its core traits, but we did want to do something a bit different, you know, and, and still make it stand out and be unique. Um, and so we thought about like kind of going harder on the idea of like the, the mutations and the animal, uh, traits and whatnot. You know, and because I know in The Witcher, it's a little bit more nebulous and and vague. You know, they they do get mutated and they are mutants and they kind of have these enhanced abilities, but they're not like, you know, quote unquote, like turning into animals, I guess. Uh, And and we just thought that would be a cool addition Um, in terms of play style there, the other all rounder um, and, uh, you know, and. I would say they're kind of like the form where they kind of do play all the different roles. You know, they're, they're not squishy. They they can tank a little bit, but they're not a tank and they definitely can do a lot of damage, you know, and they have some utility, a little bit of spell casting. They kind of dabble their feet in all the different, uh, fields, you know, that exist. Uh, unlike the accursed Ember, instead of like specializing in one, but having the choice, it's kind of like, you're going to be able to juggle it all as the monster slayer. And, and their keynote, too, is their mutation. Um, you know, that's really what makes them stand out because it can really be anything. We leave a lot of that up for the player. You know, they choose the animal. They choose the traits that, like, are prominent on them. You know, they can have wings and or, like, have claws and, you know, have sharp teeth or uh, other features, whatever they want, really, you know. Yeah, and we, we've gotten some very creative ones already. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's oh. a whole table um it, I'm trying to remember the name of it offhand i think it's the organization tracker uh reputation tracker maybe yeah um, where as you level up you know and you pick your basic improvements uh you can pick to go up the ranks within your organization that you're working for and uh they let you pick like if you want an inherent immunity to a certain status effect or if you want a new monster move or if you want to upgrade a pre-existing one um already there's a lot of like creativity on like what animal you want and what move you get but like as you further your like augmentations you really do get to kind of personalize how you like continue to augment yourself with these mutations Mm -hmm. and one one um one particular aspect especially with the games as much as the 
author of The Witcher doesn't let doesn't like those games. <laughs> although although in his although in his case I think the sole reason he did that lawsuit was because was because of his wife, but I digre- <laughs> but I digress. Um there's a great deal of time of time spent in mo- in most jobs just tracking and observing the habits of um the monsters that they would hunt. Yeah. And you and the fact that while wit while witchers have have some magic effects with the signs the I wouldn't call I wouldn't call them full on casters because the way Yeah. The way the signs are used is more is more as utility than as as outright offense. Most of the offense yeah. is still with is still with the swordsmanship. Um, is that something that you guys had tr- had tried to integrate in integrate into the design of the monster slayer? Yeah, so it's not inherent. You have to basically level up into it, but it's you know, cause, but essentially, I took the three keynotes from like the games of like the the poison brewing the swordsmanship and the rune casting and stuff um and those are like kind of your advanced moves and you kind of like at some point i think if you like don't pick any moves from another playbook i think you can get them all but you can at least get two i'm pretty sure um and uh and so you you kind of choose like those routes so you know there's a move that helps them become really good at like fighting melee, you know, uh, doubling up their attacks and really like harnessing that that weapon power. You have one that lets them make really crazy like you know poisons, kind of like in the game to buff themselves. Mm-hmm. And then they they have one that basically allows them to make a, like a simplified version of the of like the magic system in the game because the magic system has like all these effects and you mix and match effects with tags and you know it, it it's uh there's a lot going on there you know but the idea to kind of get that cool like little aspect that they had from the games was like instead of getting all the magic choices you kind of like pick and choose the ones you like and you can use them really fast you know and they're they're slightly you know i wouldn't say weaker but like you know they're they're more at your disposal and you kind of like have your little retinue like your little runes you know that you keep with you um for that quick casting and uh we uh, we've had a lot of fun with those (laughs) no i i picked it in one of my playtest characters and they they did some pretty crazy stuff with it yeah uh now with the with that in mind Obviously, the ne- the next one that I have on the list is the pl- is the plague doctor. Yeah, uh, and if you're doing dark fantasy, you got you got to have somebody in a plague. Desk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, uh, remember how earlier I told you how at some point during development, all the classes kind of got like upscaled in power. Um, the plague <laughs> doctor is why. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. This one's well, all you, champ. They're 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 pretty strong. Uh, they're, they've had to go through a few changes. Probably one of the few classes we've uh, scaled back in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, that was at the end of that long night stint of making seven classes in a row. Uh, I I think I was starting to lose it. Yeah. Um. And uh, but you know you the truly lose what you never had. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um. But, you know, the Plague Doctor, it, it, it's kind of secretly a fan favorite. It's very strange. I did not think it would be very popular. I was like, I'm just going to throw this here, you know. And, and I know a bit about, like, you know, I liked Darkest Dungeon. That's not really what it was inspired on. But, you know, just the whole Plague Doctor trope of fantasy, you know, making potions and being kind of like this spirit of the night thing I, I really liked. And... uh you know, they're a little bit more ethereal, you know, uh, and, and like mysterious. Um, and, and also, I, I really thought what would be really cool is that since this game and the world in it like covers a lot of different cultures is not even just the classic Plague Doctor, but kind of like these masked like me- medicine men and women, you know, of different cultures, you know, too, like imagining a, a kind of... Uh, like an Aztecian one in, in really cool 
uh, garb and 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 clothing hearkening to that, or maybe yeah. you know a more Eastern styled one, um, you know, all with their own unique masks and aesthetics and whatnot going on. And uh, but in terms of play style, uh, they are very interesting. They're technically a rogue mage hybrid. Um, and, and primarily because we haven't hit a lot of them, the rogues we viewed or I view in more of the D and D sense of like being good at utility and skills and stuff. Now we don't have skills like D and D does, but you know, the idea is that they have a lot of mobility and like options. Um, you know, so the, the, the plague doctor definitely has a lot of that. They have these injections that can hand out buffs. They have a healing option. You know, they, in an advanced move, they have like basically a teleport, except it doesn't have to be a teleport. Uh, <laughs> fucking teleport. But, you know, uh, I, I've definitely uh, harassed a few players with that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, but they also, in a sense, can do a lot of damage, like a, like a classic D&D rogue can. They, they've, uh, you know, so they kind of have like this like two paths that you can go in terms of their play style, where you can go full support, where you've got like, you know, buffs and healing and you know, utility and making resistances to certain effects and studying monsters. Or you can go the opposite where it's like you cut them up and you cut them real good and you're very hard to catch, um, you know. And so they, they do, in a sense, like they've got one of uh, the best, like if we're talking in a classic tabletop sense, like rogue kits going on. But there, there's a lot to them. You know, they can do a lot. Uh, I know in... A campaign I'm running right now. Uh, we've got one that is doing the full support, and uh, that they 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 provide a lot in that sense. Um, but you know, the the they they're a pretty versatile class, you know. And I think anyone that either wants to deal really high damage or uh, want to be really useful to the team, especially maybe like outside of a combat scenario, like a plague doctor, has got your back. Um, and uh, hearkening back to that like sweeper fan favorite, when we were like culminating the first group of play testers, which was like mainly like friends of friends and anyone like we were really close with, but we had some other people who hopped in. We we did a poll of like what's the class you want to play the most, second most, and least likely to play. Mm -hmm. And we have these classes inspired by very famous IPs like Berserk, Dark Souls, uh, The Witcher, all that. Um, and it really was a like kind of a landslide for Plague Doctor, which neither TJ nor I expected. Yeah. Um, but I, I won't speak for a. Uh, I, I think it's Wobo who's playing Plague Doctor in your group. Yeah. Um, every Plague Doctor that I've personally either witnessed or like ran the game for, they're they're all just the worst. <laughs> <laughs> they're all just like they're either extremely helpful but they like are insufferable or they're just not helpful. But <laughs> that's, that's a personal thing. I'm not saying if you're a plague doctor, you're scum, uh, but just I'm, I want to push um, a motive of be good plague doctors out there. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> don't troll the group with your yeah. awesome powers. He won't say it, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> but, Next up is the Rune Haunter, and speaking of of um of being inspired by famous IPs, um, it's a bit in it's a bit interesting that that you invoked Wizard of Legend with with this, <laughs> which, as somebody who's dipped around in that in that game, the the vibe I get with the Rune Haunter is somebody who is is going is going to be going to be the the quintessential blaster caster. Yep. Yep. <laughs> that 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 game is our indie darling. But Joe, yeah. you 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 take the reins. Oh, the the Rune Haunter. Uh, anyone who's like in our Discord, our our social circle, they know I'm ride or die Rune Haunter. Um, Rune Haunter. Uh, they were one of the last classes to be made. I think in the last four. Yeah. Uh, mind you, I was playing catch up. Uh, there were like <laughs> seven classes on the table uh, <laughs> but I was looking and we had two mages and I was like god there's gotta be something else we haven't touched 
And out of all the IPs in the world, my brain was like, that indie game I really like. <laughs> um, no, but The Wizard of Legend, great game. Uh, go, go support it if if you're unfamiliar. It's it's a roguelike. I'm, oh, I'm not yeah. sponsored. Not sponsored at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just fun fact, while promoting uh, The Wizard of Legend, like subreddit, all of them, they are so fed for content for that game. That when I was like, hey, Wizard of Legend content, everyone jumped on it. They're, they're really great over there. Mm -hmm. uh, that tangent on that over. But the Rune Haunter itself, um, they are very much kind of like, if if the Plague Doctor is a rogue mage leaning rogue, uh, the Rune Haunter is rogue mage leaning mage. Um, they very much are the blaster caster. Their main like claim to fame is they are burdened with these these cursed gloves that they were forced to wear either through fate, uh, coincidence, uh, some form of testing. We give a lot of options on how one might be able to come upon these, these relics, but they are able to hold elemental crystals that let them fully specialize in utilizing the elements of the world. Because in our spellcasting table, uh, elements are very prominent. Mm -hmm. um, they apply their own status effects when dealing damage, own tags. They're, there's a lot of room to be played around with the elements, and I wanted them to kind of really focus in on that. So they have a lot of mobility that they can use to get around the field. Uh, they can use their gloves in a lot of like miscellaneous ways that you might expect from a rogue. Uh, they can make elemental lockpicks. Uh, they can kind of see through the elements. Um the gloves themselves give a lot of like niche powers that one might not find on any other of the other mages, but ultimately they're huge damage dealers. Um, they start yeah. inherently with elemental punch and beam, giving them like that's that's to hearken to Wizard of Legend. You have like your left click and right click, which is your melee and ranged attacks. But in the in the purposes of the game, uh, they really give you the ability to just get in close, and if you want to explode someone with fire real close and do some heavy melee damage, that's what that's for. But um, you can also use Elemental Beam for more long-range strings of attack. Um, initially, <laughs> where I held back on making things too, uh, too complicated for the Exorcist, uh, it, it all went to the initial Rune Haunter. <laughs> I initially had, depending on what element you had equipped, elemental punch or beam basically became different moves like for example elemental beam if you were casting it in water uh it would push enemies back and it would like prone them but if you casted it in lightning it would like connect between targets and it would do extra damage and it would shock people um and it would really change around with like the range and area in which the attacks were being like cast in but I think TJ did have to reel me in and be like, hey, this is kind of a lot to take in. <laughs> but they still really do serve their purpose. They have a lot of high damage casting abilities in their advanced moves. Um, they have the passive effect that harkens back to Wizard of Legend that throughout the fight, they start to charge up this meter that um, when it like fully charges, you get to add a shit or we, we, we curse nope. here on the Cast, Do right? not right. worry about cursing. All right. Uh, <laughs> you do a fuck ton of damage. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can add extra spell effects to them. It's they're they're a blaster caster for sure. And they're one that I hold near and dear to my heart. They were they were the yeah. first class that I ever play tested when doing a long winded campaign. Um and yeah, they're 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 really cool. I really like them. And, I'm sorry, and, uh, I know I sound like I'm gushing, but... It's that that class is also cursed, because every time I play them, uh, I oh, suck. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I roll terrible. I can like, consistently. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it just never works. You see, I, I never have that problem, because I just assume that, that, that the dice gods are going to fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, the kind of the big running joke between the two of us is... Uh, you know, it's always Magus or Rune Haunter, like yeah, <laughs> yeah. side. And uh, yeah, I think it's cursed him because he he can't roll for Rune Haunter, and I can hardly roll for Magus. So yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So next one on the list is the Spectral Guardian, and ah, the um, titular Spectral Guardian. 
Okay, let me get let me get this out of the let me get this out of the way. How many people have been making JoJo jokes at oh, its expense? Oh, so many, so yeah. many in the in the Reddit threads that even the TikToks. They're like, you could just say it's a JoJo reference. You don't have to be scared about it. <laughs> if I'm being <laughs> honest, the pro the problem with that is, while there are some stands that are that are somewhat sentient from their creators, they're in the minority. Yeah. The thing that the thing that I'm that um I'm far that I'm far more willing to make the comparison to are are cases where you have where you have some sort of symbiotic relationship. Something like say um Legaia 2 or Okage Shadow King, aka the game that introduced to me me to the idea of a pig latin curse. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> That's awesome. Which I I was I was using whenever I whenever I needed to do some imperceptible language as a GM until my play, until my players threatened a mutiny until I unless I stopped because <laughs> they were sick of hearing me doing these long winded speeches in Pig Latin. Yeah, <laughs> I mean kudos to you for keeping it up. <laughs> but I mean, the, and there's there's plenty there's plenty of there's plenty of characters th throughout fiction that that kind of have that. Um, sim that symbiotic approach. Yeah, um, no, and and uh, it, it does suck because, like, I am actually a huge JoJo's fan. Uh, I just, I'm really enamored by the series. Uh, like, I, I was a little thrown off when they started introducing stands, but then, like, I, I grew to love them, especially season four. Oh my god, like, totally the best. But it absolutely has like nothing to do with the spectral guardian in, in any like i wrote that story that the spectral guardian class came from when i was like 13 like i i had <laughs> i had no idea even uh the idea of something called jojo's back then um yeah. and uh you know but yeah as i i think i mentioned earlier the spectral guardian was kind of the anchor and the foundation the the kind of like hallmark class um you know it's what the, a lot of the story and the world was built around and they were like the first piece that everything sprouted from you know and and i uh it, in the like it, it's funny i i'm gonna keep calling it the original story but it's not actually like uh written so uh you know it's not out there but in the There's in the, the original thing. story it was, uh, you know, a very, like, kind of tame environment, um, and it was a lot of, like, you know, uh, kind of, like, even though it dealt with monsters and supernatural stuff, like, small town, small problems, you know, and, and, and that gave a lot of the color to, like, this world, you know, I, I think the, the main character's mentor gets killed by basically just a big wolf you know nothing even special um but in that regard you know like there's it's definitely my baby you know that class uh it, it is my favorite because it came from one of my own original stories and you know the the uh the like picture we have up is a like basically a picture of the hypothetical main character the original spectral guardian you could say um Valerie and yeah, Valerie Duff, and uh, you know, and so uh, you know, it was the first class made for the game, and uh, you know, in terms of play style, it, it it's classified as rogue. I would say they definitely fall more in like uh the ranger category of rogue. Um, you know, they're a little bit more combat enabled. Uh, and they have a lot of utility, but a lot of, like, in, in their investigating and their tracking and stuff like that. Um, a lot of, like, using their ghost partner and building that relationship and, like, but they're, like, ghost, using their ghost partner to have, like, an extra pair of eyes, you know? Um, and, uh, it, it, it's, it's also been a really good time because I know a lot of players that like to have a companion or really like role-playing or having NPCs do enjoy the spectral guardian because it's like you, you have one with you like at all times you know it's kind of like having a pet but smarter <laughs> and yeah, uh you say that bro you can't call them pets. <laughs> yeah no that does seem a little cruel um yeah. <laughs> let, let's redact that one but 
Um, <laughs> you know, but still, like, um, in, in terms of like gameplay slash roleplay, you know, it's the it, it's always a lot of fun. You know, you can always poke fun at the players and get into ghost shenanigans and stuff, and um, you know, and, and they're very good at tracking and investigating. I know one of our players uh, called them the stat stuffer uh, because, like, they don't actually have a lot of, like, ability abilities. You know, a lot of people have abilities, things they actively will use, and it does something as straightforward as that sounds, you know, where a lot of the Spectral Guardian is actually very passive. A lot of it is like, oh, if you're doing this normal task, plus one to it, or if you're doing this set of tasks, plus one to it, or if you're in this kind of situation, plus one to it, you know, so they have a lot of, like, you know, they don't have a lot of, I would say, quote-unquote, unique abilities, but anything they do do, they're really, really good at. Uh, they roll really high, um, and, and I would say that's kind of what marks them out and specializes them, you know, it's kind of like that point in D&D &D where you roll a, a seven and suddenly your stealth is 25, you know. <laughs> um, they, they roll really high, and they got a lot of options in terms of their mobility, you know, but they're, they're just, uh, you know, in that sense, like a, a true and tried tracker. Um, mm -hmm. and, and and they have a, a, a funny ghost companion, you know, to banter off of. And, uh, it, oh, sorry. Yeah, you go. No, I'm done. Uh, not, not to... Not that we need to prove ourselves to, to the JoJo fans or anything, but uh, <laughs> something I do think that like does actually really make them distinct from just having a stand is... Uh... Now, granted, I, I don't know too much about JoJo, but I know that the Spectre itself is actually pretty weak on its own, where they kind of serve as more of an artificial power-up to the, the Guardian itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas, from my understanding, uh, I think the stands are like they do more of the actual heavy lifting, right? Yeah. That? Okay. All right, but that's all. I just had to get that out there. Oh. <laughs> and when it comes to the spell sword, obvi obviously, there's the and there's there's definitely the DNA of of Demon Slayer with within it, but. Okay. Would you would you say that the spell sword is one of the more consummate examples of the uh, of of the gish that's more that's more about enhancing their physical attributes it's essentially more like a um adept um i they could end up being more that way in post uh the actual conception of them is actually kind of funny because when I came back that day and saw TJ had written like six or seven classes, the condemned was initially called the Demon Slayer. <laughs> and I yeah. read that and I'm like, bro, you can't just name the Demon Slayer class the Demon Slayer. And he's like, it's not a Demon Slayer class, it's Berserk. And I was like, <laughs> oh, but we should totally have a Demon Slayer class. Um, so I, I ended up writing the, the Spell Sword that day and convince tj to change the name of the demon slayer um but i know that they definitely they there was a long point in production because they have stuff they they have their stances i think it's the the seven core stances of silver stance sun stance ocean stance moon stance earth stance wind stance and something lightning stance broken ass lightning stance um, and there was a long time, I, I'd argue maybe 70% of the books, like creative time that depending on what stance you were in, it was changing what does, does it still do that? Let me fact check myself. We've got, yeah, this. well, and in does a sense, I, I do. Way? No, no, it doesn't. No. It used to be if, if you are in this stance, you can roll with this stat. So you could be rolling with agility, arcane, influence, luck. Um, it's not like that anymore. Now it just changes up like what tags or like kind of how you can go about the battlefield. Um, I know some of them give you extra quick actions. It gives you the magic tag. It lets you apply certain status effects on damage. Um, but 
I I think in a sense that they definitely do kind of fill that gish niche. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm not going to claim credit and say that's entirely what I am pictured, but I did want them to be versatile in a sense of how they were using their physical and magical capabilities. Um, and they actually were pretty, they were pretty important because they initially had all of their stances be their basic moves. Um, it wasn't like an own unique effect. It was theoretically something another class could use a take a move from another playbook on. Um, but we ended up reworking that into like, it's just, it's, it's your own unique thing. It's on the third page. Uh, so no one else can steal from it, which really opened up the floor to a lot of, you know, unique abilities that could kind of iron out the like reference, but also the play style more. Um, so they have a lot of like, ways that they can counter attacks or like negate certain types like they have environmental damage resistances they're the only class in the game that allows them to have psychic damage resistance mm -hmm. um so they they definitely do kind of play more of a warrior role but through their stances they can do a lot of magical effects yeah um uh, tj if you wanted to chime in on something there i know you no. guys yeah, no, I was just gonna state that, you know, we've been using this uh, kind of reference of like, they're, you know, a rogue this, but leans into that. And, you know, Joe already said it, but they're definitely like a warrior mage that leans into the warrior. And, and the elements are definitely more of like an augment to their warrior play style. Um, yeah, that's why, I that's why I made the analogy to the adept, which... yeah. I'm not sure if either of you have played Shadowrun, but the adept in that is a potential archetype. They're se they're essentially people who have the capacity to, to cast magic, but use that magical ability to enhance their physical capacities rather than throw around spells. Yeah, I I'd say that's you that's know pro probably not one to one, but you know pretty accurate. Um, and... no, go ahead. Uh, the last one on the list is the Wanderer. Yep. Which yep. um, I did see the tweet you guys you guys did the other oh. day where you called where you called out Genshin because you uh, did I, it first. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was getting a little dicey with that tweet. I was pissed. I, I was like, God damn it, no! I was so proud of that name because like the protagonist of Shadow of the Colossus, his name is Wander, mm -hmm. and this is already a character that's like you're kind of the social outcast for the actions you're performing based on your guidance. And you're already kind of like the outcast of the outcasts. And then I was like, Oh, Wanderer, that's, that's perfect. And like, just seeing them tweet that I was like, no, maybe it was, it was kind of a marketing move. I was hoping people would get mad. I was kind of going to <laughs> be be fair, I, th I think there's a bit of outrage fatigue when it comes to certain community aspects when it comes with get with Genshin because oh, yeah. well there's a lot of fucking idiots in that in that crowd. Oh I could tell you firsthand about a few of them, but we'll keep that for after the <laughs> <laughs> uh no, but I was I was just trying to see like maybe they'll get mad. Maybe people will be like, fuck these guys, but that'll get the word out. And like I'm not the type that's like a uh, all publicity is good publicity. But if the negative publicity is coming from Genshin, I really don't care. <laughs> the great game, like honestly, I, I enjoyed it from when I played it. But uh, that aside, mm -hmm. um, the Wanderer is—I think this was the final class made. Um, this one was all me. Uh, yeah, all me. F fuck you, TJ. This one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, second to last, Commoner was last. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Just gonna. Yeah. We right, that one. <laughs> um, no, but they Shadow of the Colossus is a game that, like, I never actually personally have gotten to play. I, I know it's been ported like three times over. I need to just do it, but I've I've followed it with a really like strong passion for the past few years now. Um, I watched a lot of people play it when I was younger, and I thought the story was just really fucking beautiful. Uh, the the ending it still sends chills down my spine. Uh, but I was like, if we're doing dark fantasy, we really should just have the, just the high damage dealing like against bigger creatures. Um, so I'll, I'll admit 
creativity when I was first writing it, it kind of ran out fast <laughs> because I was like, okay, so they have the guiding voice that like guides them on their path and they can have a few moves where they like talk to them. They can have the move where they hold their sword up and it can point them in the direction they need to go. Oh, and they, they've got to do the grab on mount the creature and do a bunch of bonus damage. And I'm looking at like seven empty slots and I'm like, uh, <laughs> All right, there's got to be something left. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's how I came up with Phantom Carrier, which in the art you can see is uh, they can get like a very special, like ethereal animal companion. And uh, light, light spoiler warning for Shadow of the Colossus. Uh, there's, there's a really famous scene where they make you think your horse dies. So I thought kind of like tying reference to that in the official art could be really cool. Uh, they are, as they serve in the game, they are kind of the rogue equivalent of the Condemned, where they, they do one thing really good, and that's just fucking shanking motherfuckers. Like, they will they will latch onto a creature, and they will not let go. Um, yeah. Have a bunch of strong puncture damage, which, something we haven't really touched on too much, is that, um, and a lot of Powered by the Apocalypse systems that we've personally played, there are, like, some damage that's like got the pierce tag that just goes through like all like armor harm reduction um and kind of late in development we realized that was very very like too broad of an umbrella to cast for the kind of game we're going for so we did end up splitting it into pierce and puncture where pierce it goes through half armor puncture goes through all uh there's very little in the game that actually gains puncture uh, but the Wanderer has it inherently, which makes it very, like, above the rest as far as damage goes. Oh, yeah. Um, but as their rogue side kind of plays in, they have a lot of abilities that, like, it lets them, like, go into stealth. And when they're, like, not seen by any creature or, like, hostile threat, they gain a bunch of holds they can use to kind of, like, deal extra damage, add extra tags to their damage. Um they have a lot of bizarre moves to kind of play in with their outcast nature. Um, they can kind of communicate with people telepathically and alter their emotions and like kind of lay little seeds in their head. Um, they're it, you play this character if you want to be the, the weirdo. Like honestly, I hate to say it like that, but like if you've got the character that's like I have this weird curse and like these like weird like moral flaws that I have to follow, you're probably gonna end up being a wanderer they <laughs> they've got a lot of cool stuff going on if you want to just have a weird eccentric toolkit yeah um, and kind of in a similar vein to the monster sawyer how as you progress through the game you can kind of like rank up your status in the order um you gain these benefits from following the voice because in a similar like way to the spectral guardian how you always have a companion by your side uh, the Wanderer has a voice that is guiding them on their journey. Now, we've left this up to be very open-ended. Mm -hmm. This can be in Shadow of the Colossus. It could be kind of like a monster who is like tricking the Wanderer to like carry out these like evil deeds or whatever. But we actually have a few listed. Um, there's some where it's like you could be getting led by like a past family member. Or maybe you're like being controlled in this like game of like, you know, like chance or whatever um there's or a powerful mage or something yeah. um there's there's a lot that you can do with that premise and it's written that as you continue to carry out these goals your body and capabilities start to warp and alter depending yeah. on the voice so if you're getting led by a malevolent force you'll start to take on some like in again shadow of the colossus sense your body will start to become more monster than man and maybe you'll gain like some unique abilities. It's up to the GM discretion of how much they want to push it. Um, or like if you're a mage, maybe your magical capabilities get a bit stronger and you can start like performing tasks that you usually wouldn't be able to. Um, so on top of being just like a very strong uh, rogue, just outright, they have some of the most like custom background and like custom story set up. And depending on how much the GM is willing to work with the players, most way to customize your kit if they really wanted to get creative with it um they're uh very very strong but they've got a lot of room to do like other things narratively which i think is really cool mm -hmm. I, I think 
sorry, uh, just really fast. I, I think one of the biggest things that helped the Wander and and a couple of the other classes too was the classification. Uh, oh, we, yeah. we were we were going mostly like based off idea or inspiration at first, but later we introduced the classification system and. For a lot of the ones that I think were struggling a bit, like kind of like the folk hero or the Magus the or uh, the Wanderer, you know, actually really did help cement what they were what they were doing. Once we were like, the Wanderer is a rogue. We were like, hey, like now now we got this, you know, um, yeah. and uh, and, and yeah, in that sense, uh, you know, they're, they're a true and tried rogue. <laughs> Fuck you, Plague Doctor. <laughs> Down here, salt is a way of life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's the 13 in the book. Yeah. And of course, I'd, with even even with that, there's st there's still some one interesting thing that I, that I found was there's a few times where you guys where you guys talk about positioning which is interesting to me because Powered by the Apocalypse, being a rules light game and all, doesn't really put too much thought into into positioning in a, in that kind of sense. A lot of time, it, a lot of times, it's theater of the mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, that so... was something we definitely did want to push with our Powered by the Apocalypse system because there's a lot of elements that we do really enjoy, like having the playbooks ready just like kind of a pick up and go situation like this is the class i want to play here's all my information uh we really liked how the improvements and advanced improvements worked how the how the numbers worked out um but we did kind of want to push our own little creative like stamp on the take and kind of make more of a combat oriented power by the apocalypse system um which is pretty I don't want to say not popular. There's been a lot of people in the like diehard powered by the apocalypse community who don't really think this is a like a take that they're interested in. They think it kind of like muddies up the formula and makes it too complicated. Um, which you know, to each their own. Uh, like I, I respect the opinion if it's not something you're used to. It's a but... free country, and you are free to be wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you said it. Not that... <laughs> no, but um. It, it definitely is more combat heavy. A few people have tried to say it's like a middle ground of D&D &D and Powered by the Apocalypse. I don't know how much I agree with that. We already have a D&D &D Powered by the Apocalypse. It's called Dungeon World. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I did uh, look a little into that uh, <laughs> before starting this. Um, yeah, sorry. Keep going, Joe. Um, but it is definitely something where a problem, well, maybe not a problem. This is, I'll, I'll say it's a personal problem for TJ and I, is uh, we we both really enjoy having these pretty, like, grand and verbose uh, battles with tons of enemies or maybe one giant enemy in our, our games. Uh, we, don't get us wrong, we, we really enjoy the narrative aspect of it, but we have fun planning our battles. Yeah. Uh, and something that we did find since Monster of the Week was our first Powered by the Apocalypse system uh, they handle combat very, very differently than TJ or I would. Uh, you'll you'll go from like taking oh I've taken two harm that like that's a that's a bruise on the knee I'm fine and then you take two more harm and you're like I'm dying take me to the hospital <laughs> I'm, I'm out. Uh, <laughs> so when we both ran our monster of the week campaigns, we definitely did kind of push some of the rules a bit. Um, we, but. I guess kind of to circle back, it definitely was something where we're like, we like everything about this system. The combat and magic that they're putting forward is a bit on the back burner, which is fine. It's meant to be a rules light, you know, story first kind of thing. But we thought it would be really cool if we did make it more combat oriented to kind of fill that niche spot that we hadn't seen too much of done yet. Yeah. And, and you know, that, I basically uh, agree with a lot of what Joe's saying. And what I would say, too, is like, uh, be because I did like the lightweight nature and was very, was trying to be considerate of the fact that, you know, like, this probably isn't going to be like a grid based 
battle system, you know, like 4E was, <laughs> um, or anything. And because uh, traditionally, I've always made like grid based systems. That was like kind of my bread and butter for a long, long time. And in the last like, I mean, three or four years now, but I really uh, have been driven away from that kind of direction. Um, but there's still a lot of that in me, you know, and uh, <laughs> and um, but with positioning in specific, I think the way I always tried to handle it because I did really want to push the theater of the mind aspect here because that's what Powered by the Apocalypse uh, is good for, you know, um, is that I almost think of the positioning thing as a more abstract and more like almost like a status effect, you know, it's not instead of like having like deciding like where you are exactly and making the GM try to track that. It's just kind of like, hey, are you in? Are you around? Or are you out of position? Mm. You know? Um, and, and so that way they can still try to keep it fluid, but still work in some of these mechanics that I think are important, especially for when you're fighting massive monsters. Um, and because uh, uh, I, I found that in any kind of system, you know, like sometimes action economies can get dicey. Um, and, uh, you know, having one big monster by itself is very hard to make scary or difficult uh when there's enough people around <laughs> um i do find it kind of amusing that some, that some folk were were um trying to tell you what you sh what you should and shouldn't do with the with the with the powered by the apocalypse system in terms of how crunchy you you should make it when the whole point the whole point of having an open license is for people to take that system and turn into whatever they want yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> There, there was, I won't name names or anything, but there was one guy that was, that was really giving us a hard time <laughs> where he basically was like, how are you going to make, well, the first thing he said was the only dark fantasy system I, or reference I see in this list is like the Witcher. And we're like looking at Dark Souls, Berserk, Berserk. like all these super dark fantasy. Shadow of the Colossus. <laughs> Yeah, and they're like, how are you going to make these all fit into one setting? And, you know, TJ's very much handled more of the lore. I've always been kind of more of the business side of things, you know, the marketing. And I was like, I'm personally like, I'm not the biggest lore guy, but I know a great amount about it. And here's how we made all of this kind of work into one compass. And I gave him like, not a very like long description, but it was about a paragraph. Mm -hmm. And he shoots back immediately like, okay. First of all, I don't even consider systems with more than 10 playbooks. And we we're like, okay. And he's like, and I hate lore. I do not give and a Why fuck the hell did you ask lore. him about lore? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, and he was he was straight up like, yeah, lore is just homework for the DM. And I was like, you literally asked for it though. <laughs> and uh that guy and he just it rustled our jimmies. A yeah. <laughs> As far as far as the whole thing of lore of lore is just ho is just homework for the GM, then to th to that I say, explain explain why so many people play ex explain to me why so many people um, demanded a Warhammer 40k R TTRPG to the point where yeah. heresy oh my God. sold out in six fucking minutes. Oh yeah. My God. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, just Dude, Warhammer think... fans love homework, right. and I I know because I'm a Warhammer fan. <laughs> something something that I've been critical of over the over the last eight years since I've been doing this is there is a subset of people in TTRPGs as a whole that I think overly fetishize simplicity. And yeah, you can. To the to the point where any sort of complexity they they end up hissing at like they're a rabid cat. And the problem that, the problem is crunch fluff and uh, rules light rules heavy. It's on a pendulum, and you can swing too far one way or the other way. And yeah, um, the example I've I always use when it comes to swing too far the other way is fate. Because oh yeah yeah, 
the the big problem that the the big problem that I've had with Fate to the point where the, to the point where I don't even review much in the way of Fate RPGs because I'd feel like I'd be repeating myself is doing a very bad job at explain at explaining what makes a good or bad aspect. And the pro and that's a problem because well aspects are one of the core pillars of the game's design. Right. Oh. Uh, and there's the, there's this there seems to be this idea there seems to be this idea that um that th things like lore or the like can be fi can be filled in by the GM except a a campaign with enough time is going to develop lore all on its own. Hell, yeah, there is lore when it comes to this show <laughs> that I, that I've been and I have and it's not even it's not even sometimes sometimes it's in jokes sometimes it's more it's more than that sometimes it's just repeat repeat parts of the philosophy. Um, sometimes it's things like like me bringing up the holy book of grudges. Or, or me, or the or the time that I re the time that I lost my temper one moment and 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 yelled, "What the fuck is an aura?" Oh, <laughs> over a over a over a certain game's quick start that didn't explain what auras were in the in the material. But I think I think that when, I think that the ideal balance when it comes to when it comes to that lore pendulum. Oddly enough, comes from something in fourth edition. Huh. There was that po there was that philosophy of points of light. That was that was one of the core philosophies they had with the actual attempt at a setting that fourth edition had, instead of the half in half out things that D and D has had before and since. Yeah. Uh this that uh, one of. Th the idea the idea that th that um that instead instead of full on nations you have you have a collection of city states and a wilderness that's deemed extremely dangerous to go to f to go too far into especially since this is a place that's built on the backs of two si to um on several civilizations in the past that rose and f and fell to their own hubris oh huh. uh -huh. I've, I'm I re I there's a lot of stuff in fourth edition that I really liked that hasn't been carried over since, and I've and I've gotten my fair share of shit for liking fourth edition to the point where I call it the edition I'm told to hate, but don't because the check didn't clear. <laughs> <laughs> because in in the words of Goodfellas, "Fuck you, pay me." <laughs> but well, I mean, like. It's also a matter of, I think, the way that we handled the lore. Because obviously, when we were making the classes in the game, TJ had a story in mind for it. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, we did want to make something that, like, wasn't necessarily, like, bounded by it. Mm -hmm. They were meant to be, like, kind of archetypes that people could take and spin them in their own way. Yeah. Um, but I was mostly inspired by Blades in the Dark and how they handle their lore. How they basically write up like basically everything you need to play the game, and then at like near the back of the book, they're like, "Okay, here's an entire fucking world with cities and different like gangs and and locations that you can use." Like making it like not necessarily something that you need to have, but if you wanted a startup, it's all there, mm. and that's how yeah. our like classes worked in with it. Um, Whenever so I like. Whenever I needed to give the elevator pitch to somebody when I was running Blades in the Dark, I'd usually say, "Have you played the Thief games? Yes. Have you played <laughs> Dishonored? Yes. All right, all right. Think of that. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Deep Thief pull. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, and in that regard, that I loved that that Blades in the Dark did that, you know. And because I'm such a lore and narrative guy myself, like we we just we we just went full hog on it, you know, and. Uh, there's definitely quite a bit in the back of the book, you know. Oh, it's yeah. optional. Uh, <laughs> but I definitely know, like, past this game's release, I, I definitely want to try to get more of that world out there. You know, whether that's in the form of, like, 
I guess, like mini modules or just like little compendiums to, to really flesh that out, you know, and because in a way, like, you know, I've never really relied on supplementary material because I I'm just so, uh, I guess, egotistical of my own stuff. But the few times I did, I actually really liked it because it felt so like lightweight, like a lot of the heavy lifting was done for me, you know. And the few times that I did use, like, modules or lore books or things that I wasn't making myself, I I, I loved it, you know? Because I was like, wow, not only is it, like, cool that someone put all this thought and extra work into, but, like, you know, like, as a GM, it was very nice to just be like, hey, man, I can literally just sit down and read this stuff and someone put all the effort of making a cool sounding setting <laughs> for me, you know, and it, it was it was a lot of fun. It was very different than my usual style, but I enjoyed it, you know, and I, I hope in part that I can uh, kind of provide some of that with, with the lore, you know, like because there are a lot of people that are creative and want to tell their own story. But I think there's a lot of people that just kind of want to like, you know, maybe cruise through it. Or maybe do a mixture of both, you know? Um, and I assure you, TJ is anything but short on ideas. <laughs> yeah. we, we, we've uh, cut out quite a bit already. <laughs> yeah, no, we literally have like two, maybe even three books worth of stuff that we still would like to do if given the chance. Mm -hmm. uh, when you said, when you said anything, when you said anything but anything but short, I'm... I'm envisioning that both of you are are shorter than me or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, I'm pretty short, definitely. I'm six six. I'll leave. All it right. That. Oh, okay. You know yeah. I'm just gonna flop Damn. it on the table like I, that. <laughs> I I think you're taller than even our tallest friend. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh five ten over here. <laughs> yeah, I, I get my fair share of tall guy jokes. <laughs> And in, and to keep things balanced, I tr I try and um, make as many short jokes as needed. But <laughs> how many times do you think, like, whenever you're having those height jokes, does your short friend be like, "You're closer to to crotch punching range"? Because that's the one I always hear get used. <laughs> um, I did I did go I did goad somebody in, into say, saying, "If you really th if you really think that, then go then go ahead and take the hit." Um, <laughs> then he did, and he did, he ended up hurting his hand because what I didn't tell him is I was wearing a cup. Oh shit. <laughs> nice. Oh, yeah, dude. Oh, uh, cause he should, he should have known better when I was, go when I was goading him into actually pun and actually punching me below the belt. But, <laughs> um, he should have also known better because, because I, t because I told him in the past that I had. That when I had to do stunt work for one film, um, somebody thought it'd be really, really good to not shot me while I was holding a medicine ball. Ah! I got my was... revenge. <laughs> yeah. I got my revenge using using a Bluetooth speaker so that it made an air horn noise when when um he when he was in the bathroom. <laughs> that that's awesome. Ah. Uh, you ever seen you ever seen a you ever seen a grown ass man run run out of the bathroom screaming like a little girl? <laughs> Cuz I have. Yeah, I don't I don't think I that. have. <laughs> <laughs> but now it's now um one thing that one thing that I f I find kind of interesting is the whole the whole thing of the whole thing of the ticking clock. Yeah. And, and um have have has anyone has anyone brought up um stuff like Dead by Daylight to you get to you guys? <laughs> oh, we're we we're quite a big fan around the team. Mm -hmm. uh, but just today we actually did have someone in our Discord be like, "What if there was like a like a horror movie inspired like Hunter with like teleportation and like heavy piercing damage?" And we're like, "You can do that." Uh, I mean, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> called the plague doctor <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. um but yeah no uh I, I actually haven't heard that like people uh may make that kind of connection too much uh but um i i know like the seasons and the time management was a really big 
like I guess like pet project of mine because it, it, it was something that sounded really cool from Kingdom Death, which I don't know how essential it was to that game, to be honest. But, you know, I really like this idea of like, you know, of like going throughout a season and like this problem is just constantly plaguing and you've got to learn it and understand it and track it down, you know, and and, and whatnot and, and kind of make that an element like time is now a resource, you know, you can spend the two weeks to buff your blade, you know, but th that's going to be two weeks closer to something bad happening. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and, and just kind of mechanicalizing that a little bit more. Um and because I think another thing for me specifically is, is that I really like crossing long barriers of time. Uh, you, you can ask Joe. Uh, I mean, like I do time skips all the time oh, yeah. <laughs> in in my games and stories and whatnot, you know, because I just think lives and people and situations are complex and vast and it's hard to barrel it down into, you know, a, a small set of time, you know, uh, if if we're to adequately explore like a world and a set of people in my mind i know you you don't have to and i think there are ten, tons of good stories that are very contained you know but i i really like to to see characters grow over the course of of time you know and and so i i felt like having a mechanic that kind of you know instigates that a little bit w would have been fun you know something that kind of literally makes the time go by um and to see how a character might grow or how, how they might live or change through these through these gaps of time, you know? And it's not always like that, you know? Like, there are some uh, hunts, you know, that are only a month, you know? Like, there was never really any danger or failing in that sense, you know, in other ways, for sure. But, like, you know, um, and I even had a mystery that was uh, only one night. Like, it just was one night and it was just a hyper-aggressive you know, clusterfuck <laughs> that was going moment to moment, you know, but for a lot of them, it, it is a pretty important mechanic, you know, and I like playing around with it and kind of seeing if I can push the players closer to that boundary, you know, and mm -hmm. and, and, and see how they handle when they, they have to take shortcuts or not, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that said, what do you get? What are you guys shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, but just a um, approximation. Well, um, you you can find out a lot more about the details of like I guess kind of our future goals on the Kickstarter. But mm -hmm. to keep it brief here, um, we would like to try to get the digital copies of the book out to. Basically, like, we're going to look into some of the more, like, prominent online distributors, kind of like drive through RPG, itch.io, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and if the Kickstarter does hit its funding goal, um, we would, we already are lined up with a printing company. Uh, we've got it formatted for print, um, or at least, like, very near close to, literally just need to get the table of contents and a few pictures put in. Uh, if we do end up getting funded, uh, the we would like to try to get the book in people's hands. I don't want to make too big of a promise, but maybe late, late this spring, maybe a bit earlier. But we know that it's about like a two to three month process from like the printing company to get everything made and shipped out to us. Um, so if we theoretically got everything we needed done in time, we could get the books like in house to us by the beginning of February. Um, and then from there, it's just getting everything shipped out, which, you know, that varies depending on where we're shipping to or from. But um, yeah, uh, late January or late spring, maybe, maybe. Oh, wait, no, spring is the okay. Late winter, mid spring is mm -hmm. what I would estimate. Yeah. So late, late winter or mid still winter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Late, late winter, and then bonus winter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I'll I'll certainly be keeping an eye out on how on how it develops. But of course. with that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. 
Of course. And, you've oh, no, thank clothes. you. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I, I definitely might be uh, be bringing a drink next time. <laughs> uh, if you want to have a, a a two for a a one for you, on August twelfth of twenty twenty three, then I will glad for it. Oh. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>